the other part of my talk is that West Africa is not just about slave castles. Um, when I often talk to African Americans who are taking my African history class, or for that matter, any American who's taking an African history class, they don't know very much about African history. Um, and so what they do know is about slavery, slave issues, and slave castles in West Africa. And they don't know about things like the Glorious Mali Empire, or the Ghana Empire, or the Songhai Empire, or all these other interesting aspects of Africa that tell the story of old, um, ancient, glorious kingdoms that existed in the past. What they do know is the European presence, uh, things like slave issues, empires uh, in West Africa. Initially, there was a small Ghana empire, and they had great trade and things like gold. Uh, and then later on, you have in the purple, the Mali Empire. The 10th century is when Timbuktu really kind of grew as a town. And by the 13th century, it's incorporated into the Mali Empire. Sundieta was this great and wonderful king. He was full of social justice. He, had, he built a great economy. When the economy is good, people are happy. And he was such a good and kind human being, such a good Muslim. If he saw a poor person, he would take the jacket off his back and give it to the poor person. They loved him. So one of the famous stories is by the Mali king, Mansa Musa. In 1324, he was a devout Muslim. And as all good Muslims do, once in their lives at least, they try to make a trip to Mecca. So most of the world's gold supply came from Mali, and he took all these camels, at least 100 camels full of gold, and traveled across the Sahara and he gave out so much gold that there was a gold inflation in Egypt and a quarter of the price of gold fell because there was so much gold in the marketplace. Africans defined Europeans as Christians. They called them Christians. Uh, and it was a word they used for like whales or whale-like ships because they came in these big giant ships. Um, the Yoruba called them oimbo, which is the orange inner white peel of the orange. The Portuguese brought guns. You'll see guns, right? And they brought things like iron, copper, alcohol, firearms. So they, you know, they picture them with helmets and guns and in their armor, uh, artillery wear. And these are the people who did trade in slaves. And then, of course, you know a little bit about things like slave castles. Elmina is a famous one. Ghana is famous. Everybody goes to Ghana so they can visit the slave castles, even Afro-Europeans, <laughs> because at first, the Portuguese and the Europeans weren't necessarily they didn't have a racialized view of the world, not at least in the 15th and 16th century. That happens a little later. So I was thinking about sh how should I get to Timbuktu? Should I go by Pinas? And it would have taken me three days, three nights to get there. This is when I met the Ghanaian musicians. So we had this big four by four that can go on the dirt roads to get myself to a place like Timbuktu. Tough journey. And to get back out of Timbuktu, I hitched on this Bamako um, bound truck for part of the way, and then I took another taxi bus coming back. So 19 hours on dirt roads to get back to the capital. Nine out of 10 Europeans, until the invention of things like quinine, did not make it into the interior of Africa. Many of them died, so they weren't able to start really writing about Africa until the 19th century. Rene Caillé. He writes these books uh, about Central Africa to Timbuktu, across the Great Desert, Journal d'un voyage à Timbuktu à Jeanne, dans l'Afrique centrale. And so he writes lots of stories about Timbuktu. It fascinates people uh, from Europe, and it starts even more voyages across different parts of Africa, kind of intriguing um, European and, to some extent, American minds about Africa. Turn of the century, 1902, statue that is outside of a U.S. Customs House in New York City. He did the Abraham Lincoln Memorial. Uh, he's a sculptor named Daniel Chester French, and he does this one. And this is representing the continent of Africa. So again, you see the turn of the century kinds of art and how they, uh, how Americans at the time, how Europeans were sort of imagining Africa. So Africa is very exotic. She's sleeping on the one side, but at, at the same time, she's very exotic. You have the Sphinx, and you have the woman in the covered head, covered robes. Somebody like Rene Caillet, who is kind of 
uh, traveling incognito, as this lady suggested, why don't you travel by boat? <laughs> <laughs> Rene Caillé thought of this brilliant idea, hey, let's travel by boat. I dreamt of traveling on that Niger River. So instead, I just took a two, three hour little sunset cruise. <laughs> One of the things that Rene Caillé did, our, our French explorer, he went on the Niger River, right, traveled for days, and went to places like Gene. Gene is also an important UNESCO heritage site and city. Started around the 9th century, it's been destroyed and then it's been rebuilt. Built with that kind of mud type building, beautiful structures. Right? Um, I just couldn't get over how gorgeous it was. Europeans who did arrive, and in the case of Mali, it is the French who came and conquered. I read a famous book that some of you might know. Uh, it is called Segu by Maurice Condé. Now Segu is really interesting because not only did Rene Caillé, as he is traveling on the Niger River, right, he goes to places like Gene, and he goes to Segu after Timbuktu. Uh, but Segu is also important because it was the place where Europeans, uh, the French conquered Mali, and then they set up their administrative capital in Segu. So you'll see this French building, right, in contrast to some of the other buildings you've seen in Mali. And this is how the French colonized and conquered and how they ruled Mali. It's a different city called Segu. And they were actually a different empire. They were called Segu. And they're actually the Bozo people here. Um, the Bozo people make boats. And then they have this whole riverine farming culture. So here's the Niger, right? And then they farm right next to the Niger. If I showed you pictures of East Africa and the kind of kingdoms they developed there, you would, you would be like, it's nothing like Mali. Yeah. And it's true, it's nothing like Mali. And Southern Africa is nothing like Mali. Egypt is nothing like Mali. So what I, what I would end on uh, today, uh, this lecture, is that Africa is incredibly diverse, right? Take African history classes. Tell the chair, you want African history. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>